Meanwhile, Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Yes, it is as you say. Jesus replied, When he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate asked him, Don't you hear the testimony they are bringing against you? But Jesus made no reply, not even to a single charge, to the great amazement of the governor. Now it was the governor's custom at the feast to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. At that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked them, Which one do you want me to release to you? Barabbas? Or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew it was out of envy that they had handed Jesus over to him. While Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, his wife sent him this message. Don't have anything to do with that innocent man, for I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. Which of the two do you want me to release to you? Asked the governor. They answered. What shall I do then with Jesus who is called Christ? Pilate asked. Why? What crime has he committed? Asked Pilate, but they shouted all the louder. Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that instead an uproar was starting. He took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood, he said. It is your responsibility. All the people answered, Then he released Barabbas to them. But he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him and then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand and knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews! They said. They spit on him and took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. After they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull.
There they offer Jesus wine to drink, mixed with gall. But after tasting it, he refused to drink it. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. And sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Of his head, they'd placed the written charge against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Two robbers were crucified with him. One on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, You, who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the son of God. <laughs> the same way the chief priests, the teachers of the law and the elders mocked him. Saved others, they said. But he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. <laughs> In the same way, the robbers who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness came over all the land. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice. Eloi! Eloi! Mama Sabachthani! Which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of those standing there heard this. They said, he's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge, filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a stick, and offered it to Jesus to drink. But the rest said, I'll leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice. He gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split. The tombs broke open and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs and after Jesus' resurrection, 
they went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, Surely he was the Son of God. Many women were there watching from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee to care for his needs. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. As evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body, and Pilate ordered that it be given to him. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and placed it in his own new tomb that he had cut out of the rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting there opposite the tomb. If, if there is one song, one hymn that Good Friday brings to my mind, it would be when I survey. Uh, when I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and pour contempt on all my pride. Good Friday, unlike any other day, invites us to think deeply about the cross, which is what the word survey really means. Uh, it means to, to measure it, uh, to map it, to, to consider it so intently that you come away with a comprehensive understanding of it, just like you would survey a piece of land, for example. When you're done surveying a, a parcel of land, you know where all the hills and valleys are, you know where its boundaries are, you know what's unique about it, you know what's common about it, you know where it starts, you know where it stops, you know it in the most complete way that you can. And that's what Isaac Watts, the man who wrote the hymn when I survey, was trying to communicate. When I consider the cross, when I meditate upon it, I get to know all that it was and all that it is and, and all that it's about, even today. Uh, you know, the, the fact is the cross from the beginning was, was created to be surveyed, to be looked upon and considered deeply by people. Uh, although the cross did not originate with Jesus, you know, the, the cross the, the instrument of crucifixion was a method of execution that was practiced by the Medes and the Persians of the ancient Near East long before Jesus' day. And it was then adopted in the West by the Greeks and especially in the first century by the Romans. It was the Romans who perfected it, if, if you will. Although Rome did not crucify just anyone, the horrific experience of the cross was too terrible for most criminals, even those deserving death. A Roman citizen was almost never crucified. The, the cross and, and crucifixion, that was reserved for the worst of the worst. It was reserved for robbers, for assassins, uh, especially for traitors, rebels, people who posed a, a distinct threat to the Roman culture and the Roman government. And that was because crucifixion was a, a terribly brutal form of, of death. Normally, the, the one who was condemned would hang alive or barely alive for several days 
which is why the soldiers were so surprised when they found Jesus was dead after just a few hours. The, the, the slowness of the death was actually a big reason why the Romans, uh, the Roman government, liked the cross. It, it was a lengthy testimony to all who watched, to all who passed by, of the power of the Roman government. The cross proclaimed a stern and strong warning to any who might consider becoming an insurrectionist themselves, to any who might challenge Rome's governance. The cross coldly reminded them, hey, just try it, just try it, and this will be your fate. That's precisely why Rome placed its crosses its crucifixion sites along her major highways and in prominent places at crossroads on upon hills so everybody everybody who passed by could could survey the cross and so have planted firmly in their minds the misery and the anguish of the criminals who hung upon those crosses about a hundred years before Jesus, General Marcus Crassus crucified 6,000 slaves who had rose up in rebellion with Spartacus. They were posted along the Appian Way from Capua to Rome, 120 miles of crosses, 50 crosses per mile, one every 100 feet or so. Imagine that. 2,000 followers of the rebel Judas were crucified by the Romans for capturing a city. 2,000 posted along the roads for all who passed by to survey. It went on and on like that. So you see, from the very beginning, crosses were meant to be surveyed. They were intended to be looked at, to be considered deeply. They were meant to be repulsive things, symbols of filth and punishment and shame and condemnation, things that, that good, normal people wanted nothing to do with. And yet, uh, on this day, Good Friday, as Christians survey the cross, we find that its meaning has changed. For followers of Jesus, for followers of Jesus today, uh, the cross is no longer repulsive as it was intended to be. It's no longer the symbol of shame and condemnation that it once was. In fact, the cross has become, in our day, just the opposite. The cross adorns the walls of homes and the windows of churches and the jewelry of saints and sinners alike. So what has happened that such a transformation could have taken place? Well, what kind of power has touched this, this shape, this symbol, such that its purposes and, and message to the world ha have been turned upside down and inside out. What's happened is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the very one through whom all life was created, died there upon a cross so that anyone who would believe in him, anyone who would trust him, anyone who would put their faith in him and give their life to follow him could be forgiven of their sin and could have life, eternal life with God. A little over 2,000 years ago, on this day, Good Friday, the one perfect person who ever lived the blameless one took upon himself a punishment that he didn't deserve so that the rest of us, the, the guilty, could be given a freedom that we don't deserve. We've, we've been offered a pardon that we receive by grace through faith, through following Jesus. And through this act of grace, the cross itself was transformed from an object that reminds people of the, the fearsome power of a jealous and tyrannical government 
to a symbol that reminds people of the sacrificial character and the immense love of the God who made us. One event, one person, one payment, one offering changed it all. The symbol of hate and fear and death is now and will always be the symbol of love and joy and life and hope for all who believe in Jesus. And that's why, you know, on every Good Friday, we remember not only the pain that the cross symbolizes, but we remember the grace, the opportunity that our loving God has made for his world. Throughout the, the season of Lent uh, this year, we, we've been talking about repentance. We, we said that to repent means to go in a different direction. Repentance means change. And more than change, it means transformation. In that sense, uh, even the cross is an object of repentance, of new direction, of, of, of transformation of meaning and purpose and symbol. The cross itself reminds us how everything that Jesus truly touches can't help but be changed. Which is exactly why Christians have always placed crosses in their homes and on their jewelry. And it's why churches place crosses in their sanctuaries and on their walls and in their windows and, and even by their roads. To remind all who will see, all who will consider all who will survey them of all that God has done. And so the, the cross looms large in our worship on this Good Friday. It's one way we remember. It's one way we worship the one who transforms. And yet there is another way that we're invited to remember and even participate in the transforming work of Jesus. And that is at his table, in the sharing of Holy Communion with him. We do that today as well, albeit a little unusually. Uh, for this service, we've made the elements available through the past couple of weeks. I hope you've been able to, to get some of those, pick those up. Uh, but if you hadn't, take, take some juice, take some bread uh, in your home, and uh, let's prepare now to receive them. We're going to recite the, the liturgy together. Uh, I'm going to lead you, and, and you respond with the words as they're printed on your, the bottom of your screen there, okay? Uh, and we begin, as we always do, with the invitation, and I'll make that to us. The invitation says, you who are truly and earnestly repentant of your sins, who live in love and peace with your neighbors, and who intend to lead a new life following the commandments of God and walking in his holy ways, we're invited to draw near with faith. And we're invited to take the holy sacrament to our comfort. And we're invited to kneel humbly and make our honest confession to Almighty God. So let's uh, take a moment and pray the general confession together, okay? Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, maker of all things, judge of all people, we confess that we have sinned and we're deeply grieved as we remember the wickedness of our past lives. We have sinned against you, your holiness, and your love, and we deserve only your indignation and anger. We sincerely repent, and we're genuinely sorry for all wrongdoing and every failure to do the things we should. Our hearts are grieved, and we acknowledge that we are hopeless without your grace. Have mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father, for the sake of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who died 
from us. Forgive us. Cleanse us. Give us strength to serve and please you in newness of life and to honor and praise your name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We continue our confession as we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Would you pray with me? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. O Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who with great mercy has promised forgiveness to all who turn to you with hearty repentance and true faith, have mercy upon us. Pardon and deliver us from our sins. Make us strong and faithful in all goodness, and bring us to everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now let's pray together prayer for inner cleansing. Okay. Almighty God, unto whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who gave in love your only Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption, who by his sacrifice offered once for all, did provide a full, perfect, and sufficient atonement for the sins of the whole world. We come now to your table in obedience to your Son, Jesus Christ, who in his holy gospel commanded us to continue a memory of his death until he comes again. Hear us, O merciful Father, we ask, and grant that as we receive this bread and this cup, we take it unto ourselves his most blessed body and blood. On the night of Jesus' betrayal, Jesus took bread. And when he'd given thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples. And he said, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then after supper, he took the cup. And when he'd given thanks, he said to them, drink of this, all of you. This is my blood, the blood of the new covenant, the new testament, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. This is the body of our Lord Jesus given for you. Take it and eat it remembering always that Christ died for you. Feed upon him in your heart by faith and with great thanksgiving. And this is the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was shed for you. Drink this, remembering that Christ's blood was shed for you, and be thankful. Let's pray together. Father, how we thank you today for the grace that you have shown to the world through your Son, Jesus. The grace that invites repentance the grace that allows change, the grace that brings transformation to a piece of wood 
and all it symbolizes to the world, and far, far more. The grace that brings transformation to a person, to every person who will believe, to every person who will trust, to every person who will follow. In a world of uncertainty, we celebrate today your sure and true love for us. And we remember on this day, with both grief and joy, your sacrifice for our sins. We invite on this day your transforming work to continue in our hearts and in our lives in these days. And we anticipate, even on this day, the glorious resurrection to come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. On this Good Friday, may the peace of God, which really is beyond all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And may the blessing of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be yours now and forever. Thank you for worshiping on Good Friday.